Mr. President, thank you. I want to thank uh, Leader Reed for the honor of being able to open uh, this morning's debate. And I also want to particularly identify with a, with a point that the leader made. There's an old saying that most of life is just showing up. And I think what the American people want, and I heard this at checkout lines in our local stores, for example, uh, this uh, week, they want everybody back in Washington and going to work on this issue just as the leader uh, suggested. I think uh, senators know that I'm really a charter member of what I guess you could call the Optimist Caucus here in the Senate. And as improbable as some of these talking heads uh, say on, uh, on TV, I still think we ought to be here, just as the leader said, working on this issue because of the consequences. Mr. President, would my friend yield for a question? I'd be happy to. Uh, the distinguished senator from Oregon and I served together in the House of Representatives. You remember the days when the House voted as a body, not a majority of the majority, but voted as a body to come up with how legislation should be given to the American people. Do you remember that? I do, and uh, the leader is being logical, and heaven forbid that sometimes logic break out on, on some of these matters, because I, I remember when we started out, and I, I joke, uh, I had a full head of hair and rugged good looks. You and I used to work with people on both sides of the aisle, and you try to show up early, go home late, and. Like the leader says, focus on getting some results. I thank the, uh, the leader for his, uh, his, his point and uh, again for the honor of being able to open this meeting. As I indicated, what I heard at, at home is we're supposed to be here. We're supposed to be trying to find some common ground. I, I know the talking heads on TV say that this is just impossible, you know, can't, uh, can't be done. But as the leader said, first of all, this has been done in the past. And historically, the Congress, when there are big issues and big challenges for the country, we come together and we deal with it. I'm particularly concerned, for example, about some of the effects that going over the cliff will have on vulnerable senior citizens. That was my background. The presiding officer and I have talked often about health care and, and seniors. My, my background was serving as co-director of the Oregon Great Panthers. If you have, for example, the reimbursement system for Medicare in, a, in effect go over you know, this cliff, that's going to reduce access to health care for senior citizens across the country. And I don't believe that there are Democrats and Republicans who want, uh, want that to happen. So as the majority leader uh, indicated, finding some common ground on this issue and backing our country away from the fiscal cliff is just hugely important, crucial to the well-being uh, of our country. And I just wanted to uh, start with those remarks. Also crucial to our country is the legislation before the Senate right now. Its name is a real mouthful, Mr. President. I think you'll recall from your days serving on the uh, Senate Select Committee uh, on Intelligence. This legislation is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Amendments Act. It also expires here in a few days. So our job is to find a way to strike the best possible balance between protecting our country from threats from overseas while safeguarding the individual liberties of the law-abiding Americans that we have cherished in this country for literally hundreds of years. This task, the balancing of security and liberty was one of the most important tasks defined by the Founding Fathers years and years ago. And Mr. President, it is no less important for the Congress uh, today.
Now, as I indicated, the majority leader, Leader Reid, has accorded me the honor of beginning this uh, debate. And let me just open with a very short explanation of what uh, the FISA Amendments Act is all about. This, of course, is an extension of the law that was passed in 2008. It's a major surveillance law, and it is the successor to the warrantless wiretapping program that was operated under the Bush administration. This law gave the government new authorities to collect the communications of foreigners outside the United States, and the bill before the Senate today would extend this law for another five years. Now, there's going to be a discussion of various issues, Mr. President, but all of them go to what I call the constitutional teeter-totter, balancing security and protecting our country at a dangerous time and the individual liberties that are so important uh, to all of us. I expect that there will be amendments to uh, strengthen uh, protections for the privacy of law-abiding uh, Americans. And I just want to say to my colleagues and those who are listening in that this is likely to be the only floor debate that the Senate has on this law encompassing literally a nine-year period from 2008 to 2017. And so if you're talking about surveillance authority, which essentially looks to a nine-year period, you ought to have an important discussion about it. And that's why I'm grateful to the majority leader uh, for making today's uh, discussion uh, possible. And Mr. President, I've served on the Senate Intelligence Committee for 12 years now. And I can tell every member of this body that those who work in the intelligence community, they are hardworking, patriotic men and women. They give up an awful lot of evenings and weekends and vacations to try to protect the well-being and security uh, of our country. You hear a lot, for example, about a well-publicized pub event, their enormously valuable role, for example, in apprehending bin Laden. But what you don't hear about is the incredible work that they do day in and day out, the hard work of intelligence uh, gathering. And I want to commend uh, them for it as we begin this discussion. The job of those who work in the intelligence community is to follow whatever laws the Congress lays down as those hardworking men and women collect intelligence. Our job here in the Congress is to make sure that the laws we pass are in line with the vision of the Founding Fathers, which was to protect national security as well as the rights of individual Americans. And we all remember the wonderful comment by Ben Franklin, I will paraphrase it, but essentially Ben Franklin said that if you give up your liberty to have security, you really don't deserve either. And so we owe it to the hardworking men and women in the intelligence community to work closely with them, to find that kind of balance that Ben Franklin uh, was talking about and we can help them do it by conducting robust oversight, robust oversight over the work that's being done there so that members of the public can have confidence in the important work being done by the men and women in the intelligence community and confidence that as we protect our security at a dangerous time, we are also protecting the individual liberties of our people. Now, Mr. President, the, the story with respect to this debate really begins in early America when the colonists were famously subjected to a lot of taxes by the British government. The American colonists thought that this uh, was unfair, 
because they were not represented in the British Parliament, and they argued that if they weren't allowed to vote for their own government, then they shouldn't have to pay taxes. We all remember the renowned rallying cry of the colonists. It was no taxation without representation, and early revolutionaries engaged in protests against these taxes all over the country. The most famous of these protests, of course, was the Boston Tea Party, in which colonists threw shiploads of tea into the Boston Harbor, of course, protesting the tax on tea. Now, there were a lot of taxes, as we recall from our history books, taxes on tea and sugar and paint and paper. And because so many colonists believed these taxes were unjust, there was a lot of smuggling going on in the American colonies. People would import things like sugar, and they'd simply avoid paying the tax on them. Now, we all remember the King of England didn't like this a whole lot. He wanted the colonists to pay taxes, whether they were allowed to vote or not. So the English authorities began issuing what are essentially general warrants. They were called writs of assistance, and they authorized government officials to enter into any house or building that they wanted in order to search for smuggled goods. Now, these officials weren't limited to only searching in certain houses, and they weren't required to show any evidence that the place they were searching had any smuggled goods in it. Basically, government officials were allowed to say that they were looking for smuggled goods, and then they could go search any house that they were interested in, any house, to see if the house had some of those smuggled goods. Now, if you're the English authorities, and your goal is to find smuggled goods, then letting constables and customs officers go out and look at any house or building is pretty much an effective way to go about doing it. If you keep searching enough houses, eventually you'll find some smuggled goods in one of them, and then you can seize those goods and arrest whomever lives in that house for smuggling. The problem, of course, is if you let government officials search any house that they want, they're going to search through the houses of a lot of people who haven't broken any laws. It's almost as if, Mr. President, you decided you were going to search everybody in Rhode Island, everybody in the presiding officer's state. You could turn them all upside down, shake them, and see if anything fell out. And obviously, you probably find some people who had some things in their possession that they shouldn't have. But that's not the way we do it in America. We really feel that there's got to be some evidence, some probable cause, in order to do something like that. And the American colonists had a huge problem with just the idea that everybody's house was going to be checked for smuggled goods on the prospect that, well, maybe somebody somewhere had engaged in smuggling. The colonists said it's just not OK to go around invading people's privacy unless you've got some specific evidence that they've done something wrong, just the way people in Rhode Island and Oregon would feel today that you can't just go out and check everybody in sight around the prospect that maybe there's someone who's done something wrong. Now, back in the colonists' uh, time, the law said that these writs of assistance were good until the king died. So when King George II died and the authorities had to get new writs, many colonists tried to challenge them in court. In Boston, James Otis denounced this mass invasion of privacy, reminding the court that, and we remember this wonderful comment, a man's house is his castle. 
Mr. Otis described the writs of assistance as a power that places the liberty of every man in the hands of every petty officer. Unfortunately, the court ruled that these general orders permitting mass searches without individual suspicion were legal and English authorities continued to use them. The fact that English officials went around invading people's privacy without any specific evidence against them was one of the fundamental complaints that the American colonists had against the British government. So naturally, our founding fathers, with the wisdom that they showed on so many matters, made it clear that they wanted to address this particular complaint when they wrote the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights ensures that strong protections for individual freedom would be included within our Constitution itself. And the Founding Fathers included strong protections for personal privacy in the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment states, and I quote here, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be searched. This was a direct rejection of the authority that the British had claimed to have when they ruled the American colonies. The Founding Fathers said that our government does not have the right to search any house that government officials want to search, even if it helps them to do their job. Government officials may only search someone's house if they have evidence that someone is breaking the law and they show the evidence to a judge to get an individual warrant. For more than 200 years, Mr. President, this fundamental principle has protected Americans' privacy while still allowing our government to enforce the law and to protect public safety. Now, as time passed and we entered the 20th century, advances in technology, a whole host of technologies, gave government officials the power to invade individual privacy in a whole host of new ways. New ways, Mr. President, that the Founding Fathers never dreamed of. And all through those days, the Congress and the courts struggled to keep up. Time and time again, Congress and the courts were most successful when they returned to the fundamental principles of the Fourth Amendment. And it's striking, Mr. President, if you look at a lot of the debates that we're having today about the Internet, and the presiding officers had a great interest in this. We've talked often about it. Certainly, the Founding Fathers could never have envisioned tweeting and Twitter and the internet and all of these extraordinary you know, technologies. But what we have seen as technology has continued to bring us this treasure trove of information, all of these spectacular opportunities the Founding Fathers never envisioned, we saw that time and time again, the Congress and the courts were most successful when they returned, returned to the fundamental principles of the Fourth Amendment. For example, in 1928, the Supreme Court considered a famous case about whether the Fourth Amendment made it illegal for the government to listen to an individual's phone conversations without a warrant. Once again, dating almost to the precedent about uh, the colonists and smuggling, the 1928 case was about smuggling, specifically bootlegging. The government argued then that as long as it did the wiretapping remotely without entering an individual's house, the Fourth Amendment wouldn't apply. Now, Justice Brandeis, Justice Louis Brandeis, wrote what has come to be seen in history as an extraordinary dissent, a brilliant dissent, and he argued that this was all wrong, that the Fourth Amendment was about preventing the government from invading Americans' privacy, regardless of how the government did it. 
And I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes, Mr. President, making sure that people see how brilliant and far-sighted Justice Brandeis was and how his principles, the principles he talked about in 1928, are as valid now as they were then. Justice Brandeis said, and I quote, when the Fourth and Fifth Amendments were adopted, force and violence were then the only means known to man by which a government could directly affect self-incrimination. Subtler and more far-reaching means of invading privacy have in effect now become available to the government. Discovery and invention have made it possible for the government to obtain disclosure in court of what is whispered in the closet. And Justice Brandeis goes on to say in the application of a constitution, our contemplation cannot be only of what has been, but of what may be. The progress of science in furnishing the government with means of espionage is not likely to stop with wiretapping. Ways may someday be developed by which the government, without removing papers from secret drawers, can reproduce them in court, and by which it will be, ena be enabled to expose to a jury the most intimate occurrences of the home. That places the liberty of every man in the hands of every petty officer, was said by James Otis, of much less intrusions than these. And Justice Brandeis goes on to say, the principles, the principles, literally, Mr. President, behind the Fourth Amendment, affect the very essence of constitutional liberty and security. They apply to all invasions on the part of the government and its employees of the sanctities of a man's home and the privacies of life. It's not the breaking of his doors, the rummaging of his drawers that constitutes the essence of the offense, but it is the invasion of his indefeasible right of personal security, personal liberty, and private property where the right has never been forfeited by his conviction of some public offense. And Justice Brandeis closes this remarkable, remarkable dissent, saying the evil incident to invasion of the privacy of the phone is far greater than that involved in tampering with the mail. As a means of invasion, writs of assistance and general warrants are but puny instruments of tyranny and oppression when compared with wiretapping. The protection guarantee by the amendments that Justice Brandeis was referring to, the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, is broad in scope. The makers of our Constitution undertook to secure conditions favorable to the pursuit of happiness. They recognized the significance of man's spiritual nature, of his feelings, and of his intellect. They knew that only a part of the pain pleasure and satisfactions of life are to be found in material things. They sought to protect Americans in their beliefs, their thoughts, their emotions, and their sensations. They conferred as against the government the right to be let alone, the most comprehensive of rights, and the right most valued by civilized men. To protect that right, every unjustifiable intrusion by the government on the privacy of the individual, whatever the means employed, must be deemed a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And Mr. President, because I have outlined uh, Justice uh, Brandeis's dissent on several issues, I just want to make sure those last two sentences are clear. Justice Brandeis said, the right of the people to be left alone by their government is the most comprehensive of rights. The most comprehensive of rights, said Justice Brandeis. And what he said, the right most valued by civilized men. And the justice said, intrusions on individual privacy, quote, whatever the means employed must be deemed a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Now, 
Mr. President, the reason I've outlined Justice Brandeis's views on this issue is that Justice Brandeis's views didn't prevail in 1928. And back in 1928, they thought they were dealing with high-tech uh, surveillance. But suffice it to say, his views were eventually adopted by the full Supreme Court. And that's why I believe it's so important that as we look to today's debate, really an opportunity to update the way in which that careful balance of the constitutional teeter-totter, security and the well-being of all of us on this side, and individual liberties on this side, it's so important that we recognize what Justice Brandeis said about the value of getting it right when it comes to liberty, when it comes to individual freedom. And one of the reasons, Mr. President, there are amendments being offered by senators to this legislation at a time when we are dealing with these crucial issues about the fiscal cliff, the question of the budget and taxes, and as I mentioned, senior citizens being able to see a doctor. Those are crucial issues. But this legislation, the FISA Amendments Act, is also a crucial piece of legislation, and that is why senators will be offering amendments in order to strike the best possible balance between security and liberty. Now, when the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, often known, uh, Mr. President, as FISA, senators and those listening will hear that discussion, discussion almost interchangeably, the, the abbreviated name is, is FISA. And when it was written in 1978, Congress applied Justice Brandeis's principles to intelligence gathering. The Congress said, when it, they wrote the original FISA legislation in 1978, they really said that Justice Brandeis you know, got it right with respect to how you ought to gather intelligence. So the original FISA statute stated that if the government wants to collect an American's communications for intelligence purposes, the government must go to a court, show evidence that the American is a terrorist or a spy, and get an individual warrant. This upheld the same principle that the Founding Fathers fought for in the Revolution. It's the same principle enshrined in the Bill of Rights. And it said that government officials are not allowed to invade Americans' privacy unless they have specific evidence and an individual warrant. Now, after 9-11, Mr. President, the Bush administration decided that it would seek additional surveillance authorities beyond what was in the original Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act statute. Now, to our great regret, instead of asking the Congress to change the law, the Bush administration developed a warrantless wiretapping program. Let me repeat that, Mr. President. A warrantless wiretapping program that operated in secret for a number of years. When this became public, Mr. President, as I've said on this floor uh, before, these matters always do become public at some point when it became clear that the Bush administration had developed this warrantless wiretapping uh, program. There was a huge, huge uproar across the land. I remember how angry many of my constituents were when they learned about the warrantless wiretapping you know, program. And I and a lot of other senators uh, were very angry uh, as well. Mr. President, like you, I have been on the Intelligence uh, Committee, and I've been a member for 12 years, but the first time I heard 
about the warrantless wiretapping program, the first time I heard about it was when I read about it in the newspaper. It was in the New York Times before I, as a member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, knew about it. There was a very heated debate. Congress passed the FISA Amendments Act of 2008, and that was to replace the warrantless wiretapping program with new authorities for the government to collect the phone calls and emails of those believed to be foreigners outside the United States. Now, the centerpiece of the FISA Amendments Act, Mr. President, is a provision that is now Section 702 of the FISA statute. Section 702 is the provision that gave the government new authorities to collect the communications of people who are believed to be foreigners outside the United States. And this was different than the original uh, FISA statute. Unlike the traditional FISA authorities, and unlike uh, law enforcement wiretapping authorities, Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act does not involve obtaining individual warrants. Instead, it allows the government to get what's called a programmatic warrant, lasts for an entire year, and authorizes the government to collect a potentially large number of phone calls and emails with no requirement that the senders or recipients be connected to terrorism, espionage, the threats that we are concerned about. If that sounds familiar, it certainly should. General warrants that allowed government officials to decide whose privacy to invade were the exact sort of abuse that the American colonists protested over and led the Founding Fathers to adopt the Fourth Amendment in the first place. For this reason, Mr. President, Section 702 of the FISA law contains language that is specifically intended to limit the government's ability to use these new authorities to spy on Americans. So let me emphasize that because that is crucial to this discussion and the amendments that will be offered. It is never okay, never okay for government officials to use a general warrant to deliberately invade the privacy of a law-abiding American. It was not okay for constables and customs officials to do it in colonial days, and it is not okay for the National Security Agency to do it today. So if the government is going to use general warrants to collect people's phone calls and emails, it is extremely important to ensure that this authority is only used against foreigners overseas and not against law-abiding Americans. Now, despite what the presiding officer and the Senate may have heard, this law doesn't actually prohibit the government from collecting Americans' phone calls and emails without a warrant. The FISA Amendments Act states, and I want to quote here because there's been a lot of inaccuracies and misrepresentations on, that, on this. The FISA Amendments Act states that acquisitions made under Section 702 may not, quote, intentionally target a specific American and may not, quote, intentionally acquire communications that are known at the time of acquisition to be wholly domestic. But Mr. President, the problem with that is it still leaves a lot of room for circumstances under which Americans' phone calls and emails, including purely domestic phone calls and emails, could be swept up and reviewed without a warrant. This can happen if the government didn't know that someone is American, or if the government made a technical error, or if the American was talking to a foreigner 
even if that conversation was entirely legitimate. And I'm not talking, Mr. President, about some hypothetical situation. The FISA court, in response to a concern, and I and others have had, the FISA court has already ruled at least once that collection carried out by the government under the FISA Amendments Act violated the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. Senate rules regarding classified information prevent me from discussing the details of that ruling or how many Americans were affected over what period of time. But this fact alone, Mr. President, clearly demonstrates that the impact of this law on Americans' privacy has been real and it is not hypothetical. Now, when the Congress passed the FISA Amendments Act four years ago, it included an expiration date. The point of the expiration date was to ensure that Congress could review these authorities closely and the Congress could decide whether protections for Americans' privacy are adequate or whether they need to be modified. So again, you go back to what I've described as the constitutional teeter-totter, Mr. President. Our job, balance the need of the government to collect information, particularly with respect to what can be threats coming from overseas, with the right of individual Americans to be left alone. It is that balance that we are discussing. And if the Congress finds it's unbalanced, the Congress has a responsibility to step up and figure out how to make the appropriate changes in the law to ensure that both security and privacy are being protected simultaneously. Unfortunately, Mr. President, the Congress and the public, the American people, do not currently have enough information to adequately evaluate the impact of the law we are debating on Americans' privacy. There are a host of important issues about the law's impact that intelligence officials have simply refused to answer publicly. I'm going to now spend a few minutes outlining the big questions that I believe Americans deserve answers to. And certainly, the Congress has got to have answers to these questions in order to do our job, our job of doing robust oversight over this law and over intelligence which, as I said a bit ago, is exactly what the hardworking men and women in the intelligence community need and deserve in order to do their job in a way that will uh, generate confidence among the American people. So first, Mr. President, if you want to know what kind of impact this law has had on Americans' privacy, you probably want to know roughly how many phone calls and emails that are to and from Americans have been swept up by the government under this authority? So Senator Mark Udall, Mr. President, our distinguished colleague from Colorado and a great addition to the Intelligence Committee, he and I began the task of trying to ferret out this information some time ago. So, over a year and a half ago, Senator Mark Udall and I asked the Director of National Intelligence how many Americans have had their communications collected under this law and, in effect, swept up by the government under these authorities. The response was, and I quote, it is not reasonably possible to identify the number of people located in the United States whose communications may have been reviewed under the authority of the FISA Amendments Act. That's how the government responded to Senator Udall and I. Now, if you're a person who doesn't like the idea of government officials secretly reviewing your phone calls and emails, you probably don't find that answer particularly reassuring. But suffice it to say, the situation really got worse from there. So in July of this year, I and a tripartisan group of 12 other senators 
including uh, Senator Mark Udall, uh, our colleague from Utah, Senator Mike Lee, Senator Durbin. I'm pleased to be joined by Senator Merkley, who has been vital in this uh, coalition, this tripartisan coalition, to get the best possible balance between security and liberty, was a signer of the uh, letter, uh, Senator Paul of Kentucky, who has also been an outspoken uh, advocate of uh, striking a better balance between privacy and liberty, was a signer. Uh, Senator Coons, uh, Senator Begich, Senator Bingaman, Senator Tester, uh, Senator Sanders, Senator Tom Udall, uh, Senator Cantwell, all of us joined together in writing another letter to the Director of National Intelligence asking additional questions about the impact of this law on Americans' privacy. We asked the director if he could give us, Mr. President, even a rough estimate, just a rough estimate. In other words, Mr. President, there's been discussion both in the press and in the intelligence community. Well, this group of senators is asking for something impossible. This group of senators is asking for an exact count of how many Americans are being swept up under this FISA authority, having their calls and emails reviewed. I want to emphasize, we just said, as a tripartisan group of senators, we just like a rough estimate. Use any approach you want in terms of giving us an assessment of how many Americans' communications have been swept up in this way. Is it hundreds? Is it hundreds of thousands? Is it millions? The bipartisan group, the tripartisan group of senators, Mr. President, basically were just asking for a report, the kind of information that is a prerequisite to doing good oversight. Frankly, Mr. President, I think when you talk about oversight and you can't even get a rough estimate of how many law-abiding Americans have had their communications swept up under this law, you don't have that kind of information, Mr. President, Oversight, the idea of robust you know, oversight really ought to be called toothless oversight if you don't have that kind of information. And the director declined to publicly answer this question. So our tripartisan group and, and others continued. We asked the director if anyone else has already done such an estimate. We didn't ask about doing anything new. Mr. President, the intelligence community said, oh my goodness, it'll be so hard to give you even a rough estimate. So we said, okay, just tell us if anyone else has already done such an estimate. The director declined to publicly answer this question as well. Mr. President, right at the heart of this discussion is if we're serious about doing oversight to Congress ought to be able to get a straightforward answer to the question. Have any estimates been done already as to whether law-abiding Americans have had their communications swept up under the FISA authority? Second, if you want to understand this law's impact on Americans' privacy, you probably want to know whether any wholly domestic communications have been collected under the FISA authorities. Now, when you're talking about wholly domestic communications, Mr. President, you're talking about one person in the United States talking to another person who is also in the United States. This law contains a number of safeguards that many people thought would prevent the warrantless collection of wholly domestic U.S. communications, and I think the Congress ought to know whether these safeguards are working or not. So our tripartisan group of senators dug into this issue as well. And we asked the director back in July, we asked him if he knew whether any wholly domestic U.S. communications had been collected under the FISA Amendments Act. So Mr. President, here we are talking about wholly domestic communications from one American, for example, in Rhode Island to another American and the home state of Senator Merkley and myself. I'm disappointed to say the director declined to answer this question as well. So let's contemplate that for a moment. 
A tripartisan group of senators, Democrats, Republicans, independents, asked if they knew, if the government knew whether any wholly domestic communications had been collected under the FISA law, and the head of the intelligence community declined to publicly provide a simple yes or no response to that question. So, Mr. President, that means that the FISA Amendments Act involves the government going to a secret court on a yearly basis and getting programmatic warrants to collect people's phone calls and emails with no requirement that these communications actually belong to people involved with terrorism or espionage. This authority isn't supposed to be used against Americans, but in fact, intelligence officials say they don't even know how many American communications they are actually collecting. And the fact is, once the government has this pile of communications, which contains an unknown but potentially very large number of Americans' phone calls and emails, there are surprisingly few rules about what can be done with it. For example, Mr. President, there is nothing in the law that prevents government officials from going to that pile of communications and deliberately searching for the phone calls or emails of a specific American, even if they don't have any actual evidence that the American is involved <clears throat> in some kind of wrongdoing, some kind of nefarious activity. Again, if it sounds familiar, it ought to, because that's how I began this discussion, talking about these sort of general warrants that so upset the colonists. General warrants allowing government officials to deliberately intrude on the privacy of individual Americans at their discretion was, as I've outlined this morning, the abuse that led America's founding fathers to rise up against the British, and they are exactly what the Fourth Amendment was written to prevent. If government officials want to search an American's house or read their emails or listen to their phone calls, they are supposed to show evidence to a judge and get an individual warrant. But this loophole in the law allows government officials to make an end run around traditional warrant requirements and conduct backdoor searches for Americans' communications. Now, let me be clear, Mr. President, if the government has clear evidence that an American is engaged in terrorism, espionage, the serious crimes, I think the government ought to be able to read that person's emails and listen to that person's phone calls. I believe and have long felt that that is an essential part of protecting public safety. But government officials ought to be required to get a warrant. There are even, as you know, Mr. President, emergency provisions, and I support these strongly as well, that allow for an authorization, an emergency authorization, before you get the warrant, in order to protect the well-being of the American people. So what we want to know at this point, if you're trying to decide whether the constitutional teeter-totter is being properly balanced or is out of whack, you want to know whether the government has ever taken advantage of this backdoor search loophole and conducted a warrantless search for the phone calls or emails of specific Americans. So when the tripartisan group wrote to the Director of National Intelligence, we asked him to state whether the intelligence community has ever deliberately conducted a warrantless search of this nature. The Director declined to respond to this as well, declined to respond to a tripartisan group of senators simply asking, has the intelligence community ever deliberately conducted a warrantless search of this nature? nature? Now, if anybody is kind of keeping score on this, you'll notice that the director refused to publicly answer any of the questions that was asked in our letter. So if you're looking for reassurance that the law is being carried out in a way that respects the privacy of law-abiding American citizens, you won't find it in his response. I should note that the director did provide uh, additional responses in a highly classified attachment to his letter. 
Mr. President, this attachment was so highly classified that I think of the 13 senators who signed the letter, the tripartisan group, 11 of those 13 senators don't even have staff who have the requisite security clearance to read it. So naturally, that makes it hard for these senators, let alone the public, to gain a better understanding of the privacy impact of the law. Several uh, senators sent the director a follow-up letter last month, again urging him to provide public answers to what we felt were straightforward questions, really sort of a minimum set of responses that the Congress needs to do oversight, and the director refused as well. Now, Mr. President, intelligence officials don't deny the facts that they have, that uh, the facts that I've outlined this morning, they still insist they are already protecting innocent Americans' privacy. There's a lot of discussion about how this program is overseen by the secret FISA court, how the court is charged with ensuring that all of the uh, collection carried out under this program is constitutional. Now, to respond to those arguments, I just note that under the FISA Amendments Act, the government does not have to get the permission of the FISA court to read particular emails or listen to particular phone calls. The law simply requires the court to review the government's collection and handling procedures on an annual basis. There's no requirement in the law for the court to approve the collection and review of individual communications, even if government officials set out to deliberately read the emails of an American citizen. And even when the court reviews the government's collection and handling procedures, it's important to note that the FISA court's rulings are made entirely in secret. It may seem hard to believe, but the court's rulings that interpret major surveillance law and even the U.S. Constitution in significant ways, these are important judgments, and the public has absolutely no idea what the court is actually saying. And what it means is that our country is in effect developing a secret body of law so that most Americans have no way of finding out how their laws and their constitution is being interpreted. That's a big problem, Mr. President. Americans don't expect to know the details of how government agencies collect information, but Americans do expect those agencies to operate within the boundaries of publicly understood law. And Americans need and have a right to know how those laws and the Constitution are interpreted so they can ratify the decisions that elected officials make on their behalf. Putting it another way, Mr. President, I think we understand that Americans know that intelligence agencies sometimes have to conduct secret operations, but the American people don't expect these agencies to rely on secret law. President, I think we understand that the work of the intelligence community is so extraordinarily important. I see the distinguished chair of the committee you know, here. Every member of our committee, every member, feels that it's absolutely critical to protect the sources and methods by which the work of the intelligence community is being done. But we don't expect the public to, in effect, just accept secret law. When you go to your laptop and you look up a law, it's public. It's public. But what I've described is a growing pattern of secret law that makes it harder for the American people to make judgments about the decisions that are being made by those in the intelligence community, and I think that can undermine the confidence the public has in the important work being done by the intelligence community. Now, if you think back to colonial times, when the British government was issuing writs of assistance and general warrants, the colonists were at least able to challenge these warrants in open court. So when the courts upheld those writs of assistance, ordinary people could read about the decision and people like James Otis and John Adams could publicly debate whether the law was adequately protecting the privacy of law-abiding individuals. 
But if the FISA court were to uphold something like that today, in the age of digital communications and electronic surveillance, it could conceivably pass entirely unnoticed by the public, even by those people whose privacy was being invaded. Since 2008, I and other senators have urged the Department of Justice and the intelligence community to establish a regular process for reviewing, redacting, and releasing the opinions of the FISA court that contain significant interpretations of law so that members of the public have the opportunity to understand what their government thinks their law and their constitution actually means. Now, Mr. President, I'm not talking about a need to release every single routine decision that's made by the court. And obviously, most of the cases that come before the court contain sensitive information about intelligence sources and methods that are appropriate to keep secret. And I don't take a back seat, Mr. President, to any member of this body in terms of protecting the sources and methods of those in the intelligence community doing their important work. But the law itself should never be secret. And what federal courts think the law and the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution actually mean should never be a secret from the American people the way it is today. And Mr. President, I'm going to wrap up. I see Senator Merkley here, Senator Feinstein. I have just a couple of additional points I'd say to the chair. I was encouraged in 2009 when the Obama administration wrote to Senator Rockefeller and myself to inform us that they would be setting up a process for redacting and releasing those FISA court opinions that contain significant interpretations of law. Unfortunately, over three years later, this process has produced literally zero results. Not a single redacted opinion or summary of FISA court rulings has been released. I can't even tell if the administration still intends to fulfill this promise. I often get the feeling that they're hoping that People will go away and forget the promise was made in the first place. I should note in fairness that while the administration has so far failed to fulfill this promise, the intelligence community has sometimes been willing to declassify specific information about the FISA court's rulings in response to requests from myself and other senators. For example, in response to a request that I made this past summer, the intelligence community acknowledged that on at least one occasion, this was an acknowledgment, Mr. President, from the intelligence community. The intelligence community acknowledged that at least, on at least one occasion, the FISA court has ruled that collection carried out by the government under the FISA Amendments Act violated the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. I think that's an important point to remember when you hear people saying that the law is adequately uh, protecting Americans' uh, privacy. And I would also note that on this point, that partially declassified uh, internal reviews of the FISA Amendments uh, Collection Act have noted that certain types of compliance issues continue to occur. Continue to occur, Mr. President. Two last points, if I might. Beyond the fact that the programmatic warrants authorized by the FISA Amendments Act are approved by a secret court, the other thing that intelligence officials cite is that there are, quote, minimization procedures to deal with the issues that uh, those of us who are concerned about the privacy uh, rights have raised. This is a odd term, Mr. President, but it simply refers to rules for dealing with information about Americans. Intelligence officials will tell you that these are pretty much taking care of everything, and if there aren't enough privacy protections in the law itself, Minimization procedures provide all the privacy protections that any reasonable person could ever want or need. Now, these minimization procedures are classified, so most people are never going to know what they say. And as somebody who has access to the minimization procedures, Mr. President, I'll make it clear that I think they're certainly better than nothing. But there is no way, colleagues, these minimization procedures ought to be a substitute for having strong privacy protections written into the law. And I'll close that the reason I feel so strongly about this is that senior intelligence officials have sometimes described these handling procedures in misleading ways and make protections for Americans' privacy sound stronger than they actually are. I was particularly disappointed when the director of the NSA did this recently at a large technology conference. 
in response to a question about the National Security Agency surveillance of Americans, General Alexander referenced the FISA Amendments Act and talked in particular about the minimization procedures that apply to collection of U.S. communications. Understand, Mr. President and colleagues, this was at a big open technology conference. General Alexander said that when the NSA sweeps up communications from a, quote, good guy, which I think we all assume is a law-abiding American, the NSA has, quote, and I quote here, requirements from the FISA court and the attorney general to minimize that, which means nobody else can see it unless there's a crime that's been committed. Now, anybody who hears that phrase says that's pretty good. And I imagine that's what people in that technology meeting in the conference call wanted to hear. The only problem, Mr. President, is it's not true. It's not true at all. The privacy protections provided by these minimization procedures are simply not as strong as General Alexander made them out to be. In October, a few months after General Alexander made the comments, Senator Udall and I wrote him a letter asking him to please correct the record. The first paragraphs of the letter were to General Alexander, you spoke recently at a technology convention at Nevada in which you were asked a question about NSA collection of information about American citizens. In your response, you focused in particular on Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, which the Senate will debate later this year. In describing the NSA's collection of communications under the FISA Amendments Act, you discussed rules for communications of U.S. persons. And General Alexander said, and I quote this specifically, we may incidentally in targeting a bad guy hit on somebody who's essentially a good guy because there's a discussion there. We have requirements from the FISA court and the attorney general to minimize that, which means nobody else can see it unless there's a crime that's been committed. Senator Udall and I wrote, we believe this statement incorrectly characterizes the minimization requirements that apply to the FISA Amendments Act collection and portrays privacy protections for Americans' communications as being stronger than they actually are. We urge you to correct this statement so that Congress and the public can have a debate over the renewal of the law that at least is informed by some accurate information about the impact of the law. General Alexander wrote us back a few weeks later and said, that of course, that's not exactly how minimization procedures work. And of course, the privacy protections aren't as strong as that. If you'd like to read his letter, I put it up on my website. I don't know why General Alexander described the minimization procedures the way he did. It's possible he misspoke. It's possible he was mistaken. But I'd certainly be more sympathetic to these arguments that all the privacy protections are being taken care of if it hadn't taken Senator Udall and I making a push to get the NSA to correct the record with respect to these minimization procedures. And frankly, I'm not sure, colleagues, if there hadn't been a big push by senators who had questions about what was said at that technology conference, I'm not sure the NSA would have ever corrected what they originally said about minimization. So minimization procedures are not a bad idea, but the suggestion that we don't need privacy protections written into the law because of them is a bad idea. And finally, at that conference, General Alexander stated, the story that we, the NSA, have millions or hundreds of millions of dossiers on people is absolutely false. Again, his quote. Now, I've been on the Senate Intelligence Committee for 12 years, and Mr. President and colleagues, I don't know what the term dossier means in that context. So in October, Senator Udall, member of the committee, and I asked the director to clarify that statement. We said, does the NSA collect millions or hundreds of millions of Americans' uh, data on them? Pretty straightforward question. If you're asking whether the NSA is doing a good job protecting Americans' privacy, it is one of the most basic questions of all. If General Alexander saw fit, and he was the one who said that they don't keep millions of dossiers, General Alexander could have answered our question about whether they were keeping these dossiers with a simple yes or no. Instead, the director of the NSA replied that while he appreciated our desire to have responses to the questions on the public record, he would not provide a public answer. So again, the director of the NSA said 
The story that we have millions or hundreds of millions of dossiers on people is absolutely false. So two members of the committee asked, does the NSA collect any type of data on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? And the director refused to respond. So at this point, Mr. President, I close by way of saying, I believe the FISA Amendments Act has enabled the government to collect some useful intelligence information. And my goal is to reform the legislation. The two specific things I want to do are first require the intelligence community to provide more information about the impact of the FISA Amendments Act on Americans' privacy, and second, to make improvements to privacy protections so that we can already see uh, where they are most uh, needed. So there will be several amendments that will uh, be offered. The amendment that I will be offering is sponsored by 15 members of the United States Senate. It simply says that the director of the National Intelligence uh, Agency should submit a report to the Congress on the privacy impact of the FISA Amendments Act. This amendment would require the report to state whether any estimate has been done of how many U.S. communications have been collected under the authority and to provide any estimates that exist. I want to emphasize that this amendment would not require any entity to actually conduct such an estimate. The director would be required only to provide any estimates that have already been done, and if no estimates exist, the director could say so. Additionally, the amendment would require the report to state whether any wholly domestic communications have been collected under the FISA Amendments Act and whether any government agencies have ever conducted any warrantless uh, backdoor searches. These are straightforward questions, and they're obviously relevant to understanding the scope of the law's uh, impact on privacy. And the report would address General Alexander's confusing uh, statements by requiring the intelligence community to simply state whether the NSA has collected any personally identifiable data on more than one million Americans. The Congress and the country deserve an answer to this question as well. So the amendment does not force the declassification of any uh, information. The amendment gives the president full discretion to redact as much information from the public version of the report as he deems president as long as he tells the Congress why. So to repeat, the amendment doesn't require the intelligence community to conduct any new estimates, and the president would have full discretion to decide whether any information should be made public. I offer this amendment, Mr. President, because I believe every member of Congress ought to have the answers to these questions. If your constituents are like mine and Senator Merkley's, they expect us to give government agencies the authority to protect our country and to gather intelligence on important topics, but they also expect us to conduct vigorous oversight on what those agencies are doing. And it's, I guess, a temptation to say, well, I don't know what's going on, so I'll let somebody else uh, look at the privacy issues and go from there. I don't think that's good you know, oversight. To me, Mr. President, at a minimum, if we don't pass a requirement that we get a rough accounting of whether or not there's even been an estimate done with respect to how many law-abiding Americans have been swept up under these FISA authorities, Mr. President, my view is that oversight becomes toothless. And that is not what our uh, obligation over uh, these issues is all about. There will be other important uh, amendments uh, as well. Uh, Senator Merkley has one that I think is particularly important because it goes to this question of a secret a law. Senator Leahy seeks to promote additional accountability as well with his important amendment and my colleague uh, Senator uh, Paul will be offering an amendment, an important amendment as well, with respect to unreasonable searches and seizures under uh, the Fourth Amendment. Mr. President, we obviously have crucial work to do with respect 
to the fiscal cliff uh, issue in the next uh, few days. We talked earlier when the majority leader was here about the impact of the budget and taxes, senior citizens not being able to see doctors. It is crucial work, and I continue to be part of that optimist caucus here in the Senate, believing that we can still find some common ground in these last few days on the fiscal cliff and avoid going over the fiscal cliff. That is crucial <clears throat> work, Mr. President, but striking the right balance between protecting our country and protecting our individual liberties is also important uh, work. And for that reason, <clears throat> I wanted to walk through the history of the FISA Amendments Act uh, this morning, describe why it was so important, particularly for us to get even an accounting. Remember, Mr. President, this doesn't disrupt any operations in the intelligence community. This is just an accounting of how many law-abiding Americans have had their communications swept up under, under this law. That work is crucial, too. And for that reason, Mr. President, I hope that on a bipartisan basis, uh, the amendments will uh, be viewed favorably by the Senate when we begin uh, voting. And uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, to your indulgence for uh, being part of this uh, discussion, presiding in uh, the chair, with special thanks to the distinguished majority leader who gave me the uh, opportunity to open uh, this uh, discussion about FISA this morning. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor.